Well, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Catherine and I am a young researcher with the National Youth Agency. And this afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Kat Smith for our next keynote speech. But first, I'd like to share how lucky I was to meet Kat at my first ever Labour conference. I had the opportunity to attend the Labour conference back in September with the National Youth Agency. And I met and interviewed Kat on our second day there. Kat had the ability to make myself and Lucia another young person who completely achieved. She showed compassion and enthusiasm for listening and understanding young people's opinions and passions. It was great to see such a down-to-earth MP and I look forward to what she's going to say in her speech today. I would now like to introduce Kat Smith, Labour MP for Fleetwood and Lancaster, Shadow Minister for Young People and Voter Engagement up to the lectern to give their keynote speech. Thank you. And that was a really, really lovely intro and it was really lovely to see you in Brighton and you should feel privileged actually because we did actually meet I was meant to have a coffee with Lee towards the end of the Pike conference but I got the conference cold or I think maybe my toddler brought something home from the nursery um, and I stood him up so so the fact that I met you I mean that just goes to show the level of respect I've got for you and the level of disrespect I've got for Lee but, uh, <laughs> noted. Uh, noted. Uh, but I, I have promised Lee that I will catch up properly at some point and uh, I'm sorry that today I'm a bit like darting in and darting out again because I need to be somewhere else at three o'clock so I'm afraid it's gonna be a very uh, much a very brief keynote speech and I for that I apologize but I figure I've got about 10 minutes uh, to get you from I mean you're looking quite chilled out and relaxed if I might say and um, my aim in the next 10 minutes is to completely rile you up and get you quite angry about the state of play at the moment because I feel quite peed off frankly about the state of play because I think that youth work's phenomenal I think it changes lives it saves lives it turns lives around a good youth work should be something that is available to every young person regardless of where they live whether that be in a big urban city like here in London where we stood or like the rural parts of my constituency which get one bus a day um, and rural transport is very much a youth issue, in my, my opinion. And it should be that space where young people get to build relationships with trusted adults that are not their teachers and not their parents, there, that young people can really open up. Because do you know what? It is tough being a young person. It is tough being a young person and growing up in the best of times. But if we know one thing about the current state of uh, play for young people right here today is that it's not the best of times. Young people have had their education interrupted in the last couple of years. They've seen their youth centres either shut down through cuts and austerity over the last 11 years, or they've seen youth services going on to Zoom and Teams. And, and let's be honest, like it's very hard to build a relationship with someone uh, down a mobile phone screen when you can't do that face-to-face -face contact, which is why I'm really glad that today's conference is face-to-face -face because I think that we always build better relationships and come to understand each other far better when we're all in the same space. But for many of our young people, uh, all their engagement has been down screens. And for many people, that means staying at home. And we have to acknowledge that home isn't always a safe place. You know, there are so many young people for whom lockdown meant losing relationships with youth workers, but actually also being left in spaces where they weren't safe and they didn't feel supported. Um, so I'd say that young people in the last few years have not had it easy. Uh, education has been interrupted, youth centres closed, and we've seen this reflected in the rising levels of anxiety and mental ill health. Um, but I don't think youth workers have had it particularly great either. And I think it's important when we talk about youth work and young people that we also talk about those professionals uh, that work with our young people. And often I think that's something that, particularly in this place, whenever I very rarely get the opportunity to get youth work, you know, debated on the floor of the House of Commons, which is frustratingly not often enough in my opinion, um, it does seem to always come back to the same narrative around youth work, which is youth work's great, it stops young people getting involved in crime. And it's like, oh, for goodness sake, can we, can, we, can we move on from this? Like, yes, good youth work can stop a young person entering into antisocial behaviour, but good youth work builds leadership skills. Good youth work empowers and strengthens young people. Good youth work means that that young person seeks mental health support and doesn't spend many, many years being deeply unhappy or, or, or far, far worse. Good youth work is about empowering young people to be the best that they can be, to explore those options and see those opportunities. So can we stop talking about youth work as some kind of crime prevention method? Because I think quite often 
politicians, we stand up and we talk about youth work because it's a very good crime prevention method. First of all, that puts young people in this narrative where all young people are wannabe criminals and they're all about to commit crime. And you kind of saw it a bit in the pandemic, you know, so young people, let's face it, were pretty much an afterthought. Um, so, you know, everything locks down as a global pandemic. By the way, that was number one on the risk register. So I'd say that we should probably have seen a global pandemic coming at us. Um, and it wasn't entirely unexpected. Um, so yeah, global pandemic, everything shuts down, schools shut down, youth centres shut down, young people locked away, some of them in, in homes where they were loved and supported and nurtured, but many, many not, frankly. And the next thing we hear about young people is, so these young people breaking lockdown, going out and hanging out with the mates, spreading the COVID and killing the grannies. And it just feels a bit like every single newspaper article about young people in the last two years has been the spreading COVID and killing the grannies. And, you know, oh, and then we opened up the schools and then they've all spread COVID again. And it, it's a bit like, I think as a young person, you can't really do right for doing wrong at the minute. And I just feel like I'm sick and tired of seeing just negative story after negative story about young people. Um, and I don't know if this is a negative story or not a negative story, but obviously in today's Guardian, um, you, you've got your own headline, which is brilliant, by the way, that we're talking about youth services and it's in a national newspaper. Um, but, you know, we know that twice as many youth services in England, we get twice as many youth services in affluent areas and non-affluent areas. And, and I guess probably most of us knew that. I don't think that the, today's uh, research has come as a massive shock to anybody in this room. Um, but I do worry that some of the narrative that will come out from this will be about, well, you know, COVID hit. What could we do? I want to say this, is that this is not a COVID thing. The cuts to our youth service started 11 years ago more than a decade ago. And when we put that into the context of youth service, that is an entire generation of young people who have not had the opportunity to grow up and know what youth services are. And that is a lost generation, which is why, um, you know, when um, I hope many of you have seen this uh, report, which yeah, I'm very proud of, but in the run up to the 2019 general elections was Labour's policy around youth work. And, you know, I called it only young ones because this is the whole point. With 11 years of austerity, we've already lost a generation and there is nothing we can do to deliver youth services to a generation who had it robbed from them. So I do think that when it comes to a Labour government, the priority has to be about rebuilding youth services, about skilling up youth workers. Um, and, and if we don't do that, then we lose another generation. It is so quick to lose a generation in youth work. And that's why it's so time critical. Uh, and I think Lee kind of pointed out, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the youth members of the board, and of course now they're too old. So, and I suspect at some point I'm going to be too old to be the young minister, uh, shadow young minister, um, because I've been in this role since 20, uh, 2016 as a shadow minister for young people. So at some point, I suspect Keir Starmer is going to look at me and clock the fact that I've actually got a little bit older since then. And that there's probably some younger MP who's probably better placed to represent young voices around that shadow cabinet table. But I do hope that when that time comes and I get the boot, that we do maintain that shadow minister for young people at the shadow cabinet table. Because what's really clear is that the issues affecting young people are just cross departmental. So if you don't have that voice around that top table, you're not gonna have that input when it comes to home office policy or justice policy or education policy, housing policy, whatever that is, that voice needs to be there and linked into every single government department. And that is why, and, and sometimes I get asked, you know, why is it so important that the shadow minister for young people sits around that shadow cabinet table? And it's because then I am, you know, at the highest level involved in our policymaking in every single sphere, because it falls, and there are so many examples I could give, but probably breaching quite a lot of confidentiality of the shadow cabinet, um, where my colleagues have been debating an issue and have not clocked the, the impact of that policy area on young people. Because by going into every single conversation, every single policy decision and going, how does this affect young people? How will they benefit from it? How will they not benefit from it? And how can we change it to make it more relevant and engage with young people? Then you don't have things fall through the cracks in the same way. Um, so, I mean, I've written some stuff down here that I was going to tell you about how much things have been cut. And we know that, you know, there's more than a billion pounds worth of cut, uh, cuts to youth service, basically, in the last decade. So that I wanted to sort of stress that because there is no other sector that you could cut to the extent that youth services have been cut and then expect anyone to be able to turn on the head of a pin and be able to turn it back on again. And it's reflected in, you know, the, the loss of um, youth work degrees, you know, uh, 
if you read months ago now, I think it might have been, you know, the House of Commons Library research showed that, you know, the number of youth work degrees have dropped 22% in the last year, but it's halved compared to 2008. So if we're not getting the, the new youth workers coming in through, through training and through degrees, then who is going to provide this youth service? We can get a Labour government, and, you know, I can convince our uh, Labour Chancellor to invest in new services, but we need people to deliver it. You know, fancy buildings are lovely and grand, and to be quite honest, you can do good youth work in a bus shelter. I'd like it, I'd prefer it to be a nice shiny building, but it's the people. It is the people. We, we, we need youth workers who are professionals, who are recognised, and it sounds like you've got some really good positive stuff at the minister earlier, and I'm really pleased about that. And well, I plan to make sure that I follow that up, Lee. Um, and so if, if anyone could feel you know, what the minister said, uh, in his video contribution. I'd be very keen to, to make sure I follow that up and make sure we can push every single thing we can out of that to make that as positive as we can, because youth workers are skilled professionals. They should be recognized as such, valued as such, and rewarded as such as well, because we need to talk about the pay, um, because the public sector pay freeze has, has, has led to a situation where we're expecting people to do incredibly difficult and viable work. And I don't feel that, uh, you, that youth workers are necessarily rewarded in a way that's in any way appropriate. But it is a postcode lottery, and you can see this. Um, so, so I can see the quality of youth work in my own constituency as a constituency MP, but I also um, occasionally leave my own constituency and visit other places. So last night I visited a youth project that was going on in Parkhead in East End of Glasgow, and it was a youth project called Urban Fox. And one youth worker had pulled together this army of young people and made sure that they're all, you know, part of the Duke of Edinburgh scheme. But they had put on this project where 500 young people from the east end of Glasgow went to this haunted house and had this Halloween experience in a way that was safe. And, and you know, for many young people, let's be honest, the streets are not a safe place to be, and particularly on Halloween night. They managed to do something that it gave 500 young people something to do. It skilled up dozens and dozens of other young people who built up credits on the Duke of Edinburgh scheme. And I spoke to the youth worker, I'm like, what, what kind of resources do we have for this? And she's like, it's just me, just me. Um, she was like, it was amazing, honestly. I, I have never seen anyone basically make something, she had nothing and she made something utterly amazing. And I, that, that is youth work, isn't it? That is what youth workers do. You have basically a shoestring and you transform people's lives. Now I say that is something worth investing in. That is something any government should invest in because we have to do this for our young people. Because right now, when I go around schools or see cadets groups or youth centres and I speak to young people, I just get a general sense of despair and inevitability that everything is going to be crap forever. And I just don't believe it has to be. I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm over the Labour Party. I'm an optimist. <laughs> and uh, I'm angry. I'm angry that things have got as bad as they've got. And instead of despair, I want to see our young people angry. Not for no reason, but anger that can be channeled through good youth work to be political activism, to challenge government cuts, to say this 560 million that was announced last week in the budget, that does replace the 500 million pounds that we had announced two years ago on the Youth Investment Fund, is the same money. And if you're gonna say the NCS budget's got to come out of it as well, it's a cut. Yeah. That budget that I am gonna go into the chamber and speak on next is a cut to youth services. It, you know, the Chancellor can stand up at the dispatch box of the House of Commons and say, I am investing £560 million in youth services. And then smoke and mirrors, you read the small print of the budget, and it's a cut. And I think that is deceiving. It's deceiving to young people, it's deceiving to youth workers, it's deceiving to the country when Chancellors stand up and say that there's new money coming when actually it's cut. Uh, so it's a smoke and mirrors budget that I'm pretty furious about, and I hope you're furious too. And I hope that many of you will feel inspired just to kick off because I just think we need to, we need to kick off. It's not good enough. And we owe it to the young people that we also feel so passionate about to go out there and kick off. And I'm about to kick off in the House of Commons chamber. That's my plan for the day. And I want to know what your plan is. <laughs> yeah, just watch me. You've got to go out there and do something yourself, Lee. Like, I just feel so angry and pissed off on behalf of young people. So I'm going to go off and uh, say that on the House of Commons. So that's my plan for the day. But thank you so much for having me.